If I make it to the final selection phase, I better get all of your votes. Okay? <laughs> that 
your organization that is doing this mission is prepared, uh, not just prepared mentally, but actually has the capability to send more people, more supplies, more equipment continuously. And to me, this is the, the major question that really needs to be posed to Mars One. Because it is not just a question of whether you can raise enough money to do a mission to Mars. Okay. As formidable a task as that is, let's say you raise six billion dollars from investors because you have um, these various media rights and advertising rights and other concessions that can be sold and, and you convince them that there is an adequate enough return from those things to do uh, a profit or a significant profit off of the six billion investment or whatever it is that allows you to do the mission. You need much more than that. You need to have a, a continuous income stream that would allow you to uh, constantly send more people, more equipment, more supplies, more of everything. In other words, you're not doing a raid, you're doing an invasion. This is Normandy Beach. You have to take the continent, and it's not enough just to take the beach. You have to be able to push them out of France, okay? And the, 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 the and, and go all the way. Um, that's what you have to do. So, while I think that the one-way mission is, first of all, is the objective. The, the objective of doing round-trip missions is to be able to do one-way missions. Okay. The, 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 re, the oh, I mean, if all we're doing to, it, to go to Mars is to resolve certain scientific questions, I think it, it, it it's hard to justify the money. Okay. The reason why Mars is worth all the treasure and all the risk is that it's a new world, it's a new planet for humanity, and if we can settle it, okay, or we can begin the settling of it, we're beginning humanity's career as a space-faring species. Okay. So one mission clearly is the objective. But can a private organization with limited means take this on? To me, to be frank, I don't think that the financial business plan of Mars One closes. Okay, that the now I have to admit that when I first heard about Mars One, I would not have imagined it has gotten as far as it has. Uh, I've been very pleasantly surprised by the amount of progress it has made, and the odds are still against Mars One getting the money to do uh, a human mission to Mars. But I would concede that it's possible. But what I don't see at this point is how the current business plan of Mars One, of, of doing this with uh, commercialization of media rights, could lead beyond one mission. Okay? And now I do see an alternative way that a Mars colony could be primarily funded. Okay, which is not through the sort of uh, enterprises, but through public support. That is, there's seven billion people on this planet. Uh, a billion or so live in the advanced sector where people have money to spend on things other than tonight's dinner. Okay, and of those, at least ten percent believe strongly that it's essential to a positive human future that humans expand into space, possibly more than 20. So we'll call it 10, that's 100 million people. 100 million people times $100 a year would be $10 billion a year. That would be enough to finance the colonization of Mars, no questions asked, okay? Uh, absolutely, and, and, and very robustly. So, to me, for this to work, what's needed is the organizing globally of a sufficient number of those people to donate. I mean, it, if you look at some of the most uh, adventurous, most daring episodes of uh, colonization that have occurred over the past 400 years, which uh, the, 
you know, the most out of the box, which includes the pilgrims going to Massachusetts, the Mormons going to Utah, the Jews going to Palestine. What you consistently see is these efforts were funded and continue to be funded and backed by large home front organizations for decades or uh, after they, they uh, embarked and uh, uh, you know, the people who went were financed by people back home and they continued to be backed by people back home. And it was these large home front organizations that allowed these very daring exploits to, to happen. Um, the, the, and so I think that's what we need. But in any case, that, that's, uh, I'll open it up with that. And, um, but because I, I don't think that you can go to Mars one way unless you have pulled together a massive logistical organization that can guarantee that the people that you have, are sending will get all the supplies and all the reinforcements that they could, could want. Can I reply, uh, Robert? Sure, yes. So, I would first like to ask you, do you consider yourself uh, an engineer or a media expert? Uh, I am was, an engineer. It was actually a rhetorical question. Um, what, what we have found is that the, when we talk about our business plan with engineers, they say, of course, this can be done. But how are you going to fund it? And when we talk to people from the media industry, they say, well, there is so much potential revenue in this mission, but it's not possible. Right? So, what the first thing we did when we uh, or when we had our very small advisory board in the beginning with some media experts and some engineers is organize a dinner. Uh, we had, we had them opposite to each other, and we just sat back and let them do the talking, and that worked really well. And I'm uh, I've told you about the uh, the investor that we're currently talking to, and uh, I am not a media expert. I'm also an engineer. Uh, he has helped me come up with a number of about uh, 30 million US dollars of revenue in the first year from broadcasting rights and, uh, and sponsorships and partnerships, mostly broadcasting rights. So uh, I'm, I'm not an expert on this, but I know that the figure is a lot higher than the first and the second uh, human mission to Mars. And your second uh, uh, the way of financing that you propose is actually something that Mars One is already working on. And I forgot to tell you after telling about the investments that Mars One is accepting donations, but of course not in the for-profit entity where we allow investors to participate because we would never want to uh, have donations and then uh, give them as a return on the investment of those investors. So Mars One is a not-for-profit organization and every uh, donation and every uh, uh, sale of merchandise, every uh, proceed on sales of merchandise goes only to the mission to Mars. And uh, the, the for-profit entity is actually owned uh, in majority by, the not -for by Mars One, the not-for-profit entity, uh, to finance the mission to Mars. So we are already rallying those people and we see that the numbers of people that are donating to our cause are growing every, with every press release that we made. The, the, the amounts that they give are growing. And I fully agree with you. I believe that just that might be enough to finance uh, follow-up missions, but only if you can show enough progress. You can't get uh, 100 million people to, help to donate $10 a month or $100 per year if you don't already have the organization that is making stuff happen. And that's why we do need both the not-for-profit foundation to own the Mars colony, because I, I would never allow a for-profit entity to own a Mars mission. I mean, it's crazy. It has to be the world. It's a Dutch foundation. Nobody owns a Dutch foundation. Uh, but we need the for-profit entity to, uh, to bridge the gap between, uh, between expenditure and uh, revenues. Yeah, I'd like to go ahead and address the uh, um, private funding and private ventures. Uh, when I started with Nanorax, uh, as a company, we provide the opportunity to do space research on the International Space Station, uh, and we are a for-profit corporation. We are partnered with NASA and the other international partners providing a gateway to the International Space Station. 
When I started, I was employee number five, I think. Uh, we kind of debate over who was fifth and sixth and seventh. Working out of a U-Haul on Highway 3. Um, building space flight hardware and getting it launched and shoveling to the International Space Station and uh, returning it and uh, turning a profit. Uh, since then, we've gone in, the market has changed. And we've had, first of all, we've had a lot more customers just for the conventional research um, on the ISS, but now we're also doing satellite deployments off the International Space Station. It, it had to start with just one school, one university from Vietnam uh, paid us for access and then we formed a partnership with JAXA to make it happen. Now we've launched satellites from Lithuania, Peru, uh, the uh, Planet Lab stuff satellites which are uh, um, Earth observation satellites and now we've got a customer list that is beyond the page and the market has changed again. People want to launch larger satellites from ISS orbit and the market's changed again. Now they want to have external payloads. So what well, we kind of started as a small venture working out of a, a, a little basically U-Haul storage shed on Highway 3 has experienced a huge market growth that we didn't expect and it's coming from all facets. It's coming from education, it's coming from commercial ventures, it's coming from foreign governments. Um, I'm going to quote Stella Chachkova, who's written a book on commercialization of the space sector. And she said, that, um, when I was talking with her yesterday, that the market of deep space and Mars and the asteroids is much bigger than for low Earth orbit. We just don't quite know how to use it yet. So do I think that commercial ventures can happen and will be a significant uh, factor in uh, this venture, uh, the part of my language, hell yes, it will. Um, it, it's, start, it's being proven in low Earth orbit, it's being proven on the International Space Station, and the market is there. We just don't know. Once we start using it, investors, interest will come. Somebody's going to find a way to make a buck off of it. I'm not sure I can add a whole lot to what's already been said, but uh, I do come at, from it, come at it from a slightly different viewpoint. I'm a 40-year NASA veteran. Uh, Bass and I have one thing in common. We're, we're the only two people in this room who have ever headed a, a funded Mars program, and a uh, human Mars program. Uh, unfortunately, mine was publicly funded and uh, subject to all the vagaries of uh, public funding and politics, and so it didn't really go very far. So <clears throat> maybe the model of private funding is, is the only way we'll ever get this done. I, I'm not sure. Um, I am an engineer, I have two degrees in engineering, but I'm also a behavioral scientist. I have a PhD in behavioral science. And I think of all the things that I've heard tonight, uh, that's probably my greatest concern. Uh, all the, uh, any time you do a Mars mission, no matter how you do it, the greatest uncertainty is going to be the human being. <laughs> You can test everything in the actual conditions, except you, you can't test humans in the actual conditions until they actually get there. So uh, we, can, we were concerned, we had a lot of concerns uh, at NASA about what happens on these crews in long durations. And we, we studied it. We had psychologists study it. And, and, uh, the, uh, the best thing that we did, I think, in all the, all the money that we spent doing that was that uh, we started studying the analog expeditions. 
and we, we studied the, uh, the polar expeditions, and I'm sure many of you have done the same thing, uh, particularly the ones that failed, uh, to determine why they failed, and then the ones that, that succeeded uh, despite adversity and why they succeeded. That latter list is very short. And uh, we found the Shackleton expedition. And by the way, uh, my wife and I just retraced his, uh, his expedition route to the Antarctica <coughs> last year. And uh, that was quite an adventure in itself. And uh, the reason that Shackleton, uh, I, I'll just do a, one second, uh, a couple, few seconds of, of uh, summary of the Shackleton expedition for those of you who may not know. Uh, he, was, he wanted to be the first person to traverse the Antarctic continent with, uh, with dog sleds, the first ones to do it on, on foot. And um, so he went equipped with everything he needed, and he, was, he had thought through everything, every possible uh, scenario except one. And uh, that is that when they got in the proximity of Antarctica, they encountered ice that nobody had ever encountered before. And so they got mired in ice. And it took them uh, two years before they actually, fortunately the ice was being carried by currents, and it carried them northward. And finally they got far enough north to where they broke out. And they, they the ship was crushed, it sank, but they had time to get the key things out of the ship. Um, the thing that they did is they had every person, they were all men, so I'll say every man on, on the crew had a job. And he knew in the morning when he got up that he had to do that job. Uh, one guy had a heart attack, and he knew that it was his job to to do this, this certain set of tasks. One day after he had the heart attack, he was up doing those tasks. So the, the pre-planning of, of tasks for everybody to do uh, was, was probably what saved them. What they wound up doing, they had the lifeboats, they, they got into the lifeboats and, and made it to a little crag of rock, which uh, is called Elephant Island which is nothing more than some rocks sticking up in the ocean. And um, Sally and I had a, a look at that. We couldn't believe that people could even land on it, much less uh, live there for a year or so. And so um, the, to finish the story, uh, he made it back. Uh, he took one of the lifeboats, and, and he took his navigator. And they navigated over 800 miles of open water and this was in the days before any navigation aids except sextants and things. Uh, and their one chance was to hit South Georgia Island. If they missed South Georgia Island, the next stop was Africa. So uh, they, and they were buffeted by 40 foot waves, which Sally and I also encountered on our trip, uh, 40, 50 foot waves. But that, we were in a big ship. They were in a little lifeboat. Well, to make a long story short, they made it to, uh, to uh, South Georgia. Their ship was, their boats, their lifeboats were wrecked. They made it across the mountains, across glaciers, to a whaling station, and, and uh, took a couple of tries to get the guys off, the, uh, off of Elephant Island. But every man survived, despite sleeping in freezing cold for two years in a wet sleeping bag in wet clothes. And I don't think you could have much more adversity than that. I'm hoping that uh, those of you that are going to do March 1 don't have to go through that kind of adversity. But the point is here, they made it, and they did it because they knew they, they had this shared sense of responsibility for things that they had to do. Um, so again, the concerns I have are, of course, physiological and long-term duration, uh, 5-HG, you know, we can debate that forever. 
uh, but the, the psychological aspects, I think uh, there are analogs out there that we can look to to, to solve a lot of those problems, hopefully. Okay. Uh, are there questions for the panel? Uh, let's try uh, Max. So, Bob, if the if six billion is not enough, uh, how much money would you estimate Mars One would need to raise the uh, uh, the uh, selling of media rights and broadcasting in order to make it before it would become as plausible in your mind as a more conventional approach like Mars Direct? Well, no, I think actually, if done in the private world, okay, that uh, and especially since it's a one-way mission. Um, so that greatly reduces the development cost. That six billion is enough to do a mission, or maybe even two, um, to Mars, uh, by Mars One. But my point that I was making was that this is not a one or two mission deal. This is an unending and expanding series of missions deal. That's what's being proposed here. So, you know, the most successful TV shows. I mean, 24 ran for you know nine seasons, or or I mean you know it's, you may get a very successful TV show to finance the first mission and maybe even the second, but certainly you can't finance a, a, a colony that is uh, intended for uh, perpetual and expanding uh, existence through such such a means. Um, and uh, so that was my point. My point was not that the, you know, it's ambitious. It's ambitious that you could raise $6 billion from a TV show. The Olympics raised $4 billion. That's the Olympics level, you know, and that's a big deal, okay? The, 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 but maybe you can. And, and I have to say, that, uh, you know, in my observations and conversations with Bas Bonsdorf, I think he's incredibly talented and he can put together all kinds of deals. Uh, and he, uh, so while the odds, frankly, are against him to raise this building, raise this building is not easy, okay? It's not, okay. Um, uh, but maybe he could do it. But the thing is, uh, and I think if the mission is well designed, you absolutely could do a one-way mission to Mars for six billion dollars. But once again, the question is raising two billion a year on indefinite okay, to to finance this, to be able to send more and more missions. That's that's the financial engine that has to be put in place to make this vision work. That's what I'm saying. Do you have an answer for that, or do you want to just take another question? Yeah, I think I already uh, uh, talked about the, uh, uh, the what, what you described, the donation scheme that we uh, that we are already setting up, and the revenue of the Olympic Games. And it, it sounds, it does sound like a lot of money, but don't forget that if, if we will all agree that everybody will watch the first mission, and that it will be bigger than the world championship or the Olympics. After that, the cost is about $4 billion to repeat if we don't have any reduction in the cost for every additional crew. So over the time of two years, we need to have the amounts of eyeballs that watches one world championship. And that's not, that's not a really ambitious goal, I think, with a human mission to Mars. So uh, for me and for the media experts I talk to, there is no doubt that just the media can easily finance this. Uh, but um, I fully agree with uh, Robert that, uh, the, that the donations are uh, uh, potentially <coughs> an even more attractive uh, way of uh, financing this. Bob, in reading all your books and coming to these meetings for several years, it's always come across to me that one of your main points is, let's do it. Let's get there, because if we take too long, we'll never get there. And besides this Mars One approach, what other approach is going out on right now that could even come 
close to just doing it? Well, at this point, uh, there is uh, the approach of space <coughs> attempting to develop a set of hardware elements uh, or a substantial fraction of a set of hardware elements needed to send humans to Mars uh, through various means and excuses and, you know, developing the Dragon to take people to the space station, but in fact the Dragon is over-designed and could take re-entry from a trans-Earth trajectory from Mars. Uh, you know, they're developing a heavy booster and they'll probably attempt to uh, finance it in its development and operations through uh, commercial or military launches, perhaps some NASA missions, and, and so forth. They're, they're, they're trying to build up a capability. So there's that. That's one uh, alternative. Uh, but there's questions with that, because how far can you go with that, uh, given, in other words, if NASA does not embrace humans to Mars, SpaceX will not be able to develop a complete hardware set to do humans to Mars, because parts of it can be developed for other purposes, but there's some that really have to be developed for Mars. Uh, but by developing such hardware elements and thus reducing the development cost of the Mars, program, they might make the Mars program more attractive as a government proposition. But that's one possibility. The, 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 well, there's Inspiration Mars, um, which, you know, proposed a two-person uh, Mars flyby mission, uh, which, of course, is a much uh, uh, simpler proposition than the Mars One program, and it doesn't accomplish as much. But, uh, of course, one of the very important things about that proposal is the guy who was making it had some very large resources of his own that he was prepared to put behind it. Unfortunately, the design that he and his team developed uh, was more expensive than he could finance on his own, which is one of the reasons why I called for this international contest to see if the engineering uh, students in the world could come up with a design that would make it affordable on the kind of money he had. Don't get me wrong, I think this can be done, okay? And I think this is the correct objective. Now, I, now maybe, uh, you know, if, if you conceive of Boston source plans, we'll use media money to get the first mission done and that will give this thing sufficient visibility to organize the public support for it globally to allow the missions to continue. That's a plan. It's a somewhat risky plan because when you send that first team there one way, at that point, you really want to know you have the financial engine in place that would be able to assure them the reinforcements continually. Okay. That's it. But so I think more thinking needs to be done on how to pull together this global movement. I mean, you know, believe me, the people are out there. 100 million people on this planet believe that this should be done. 100 million people, 100 bucks a year, it's 10 billion a year. It's the cost of a lift ticket for each of them. Okay, this is how I calculate this. Yeah. <laughs> lift tickets. Yes, okay, so it's just one lift one unit. Um, but the, the um, uh, but you know, the harvest is plentiful, but the gathers are few. I mean, we, we, we don't yet have an organization. We, we, fundamentally, the question of whether a privately funded human Mars mission is possible is not a question of material, it's a question of morale. Of morale okay? The, 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 you know, in other words, you can have a giant army facing off against uh, what is in fact a much weaker opponent, but the giant army is routed because the individual soldiers in it are disorganized, they don't know that they have sufficient force to win, even though they in fact do, okay? We have, the, the people who think like us around the world have in our pockets sufficient resources to fund this if we can pull this thing together. And, you know, what I'm hoping is that one of these enterprises, whether it's Mars One, Mars Society, whether it's Elon Musk, whether it's Inspiration Mars, is able to, through its own action, raise the flag high enough that the people
people can rally around it, they can coalesce around it and say, okay, we are now united behind this, we're now going to make this happen. Because so we've got the resources to do it. But that is, in, in my view, the fundamental task. There have been uh, journalists, uh, Robert, that have called me an eccentric billionaire. Yeah, it's strange, right? I'm not eccentric at all. Okay. I'm an engineer, so I'm, a, and I have the same concerns as Bob about not just the first mission, but the continuation for decades into the future. So you talk about your business plan, but I don't totally see your technical plan. So. After the first crew lands, your plan would be, with the next opportunity in two years, the second crew would also arrive. And if that's the case, do they only bring, well, one of my questions is, the first crew that lands, how long could they last without another crew? And assuming it's only two or three years, perhaps four years, they so could skip one. When the next people come, do they only bring enough consumables for themselves? Or do they have to bring their own, plus the commission is there? And then one after that, the third one, they bring their consumables for enough for the two that are already there. What is your plan? Yeah, I forgot to mention in our timeline that uh, uh, a few weeks after the, few, the first crew lands, the hardware for the second crew is already scheduled to land. So the first crew, after a few weeks, will have access not only to their own hardware, but also to the hardware for the second crew. Then, uh, if everything operates well for the next two years, the uh, second crew will actually depart. But if something breaks and we decide that it's too risky, uh, that there's not enough redundancy at that moment to send the second crew, uh, then we will postpone the second crew and send only additional hardware. If the second crew does go, then the hardware for the third crew will follow slightly, slightly behind uh, the second crew. Uh, that, but for consumables, only for um, high-tech consumables will, be, will they be uh, relying on the earth. So they will grow their own food, they will um, harvest the water from the Martian uh, surface and use that for oxygen, uh, nitrogen and argon will come from the Martian atmosphere. So you uh, believe that basically the first crew lands has the technological capability to furnish all of their food? I mean... Uh, food will definitely be a challenge. So what, water and oxygen, yes, because that, that will actually have been produced before they even depart from Earth. Otherwise, they will not depart. Uh, oxygen will be, uh, uh, might be a challenge. We don't know how difficult it will be to grow it on uh, Mars. And we know we can grow it on Earth. We know plants grow in the ISS, so it's likely that it will also work on Mars, but of course we will have food rations, emergency rations uh, that can uh, that can help them survive even if no plant grows at all. So that, that will always be uh, present uh, for their survival. But I think that actually our discussion right now is on ethical and um, private, not so much on our technical plan, or are you okay with uh, spending some time on that? Uh, no, sure, we can talk about the technical side. Look, there's no reason to believe that plants won't grow on Mars. I mean, uh, but the, 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 the role of the early missions will clearly be, well, I mean, one of the central things will be to set up greenhouses and get uh, farms established. Okay, there's been, the, the, very typically, before you bring in a larger group, you bring in your pioneers who you know, do the work of, of, of drilling the initial wells, as it were, and setting up the initial greenhouses and bringing in some harvests. Uh, and so when the next group of people arrive, there is already some food production capability and so forth. And so the most essential things are set up first. And I mean, uh, I mean ultimately, yeah, children are very much part of this plan, but before you, you, you start uh, uh, having dependence on, on the, in the colony. You want to have well-established uh, food production capabilities. You want to uh, uh, establish a, a power supply. You can continually bring in more solar panels and making your drilling for geothermal powers. So for, you know, you're, you're establishing the whole uh, economic base of this thing. And the, as it goes on, you can bring in, you know, the, 
you know, your initial most valuable people are farmers and mechanics. Okay? And then, yes, maybe geologists because the prospect for resources. Later on, you'll be bringing in, you know, teachers and orchestra conductors and, you know, I mean, and, and, and all sorts of other people that are necessary to make a, a, a civilization. But the, the, the people that, that, you know, come first set up the, this stuff. And, I mean, you, you work out a plan of, of that kind. Now, it, it, it's quite true that the, the Mars One plan right now is sketchy, but clearly if this thing gets uh, more ample funding, they'll be able to greatly expand the engineering uh, planning of, of this sort of thing. I would actually like to add one more thing, Robert, on uh, financing. So, it's uh, even if there is doubt right now if we can finance from media income or if we will, have, if we will be able to rally enough support, uh, by the time that we have sent our first unmanned mission, we have sent our first rover, we have sent, have sent all the hardware to Mars, uh, we will have gouged the interest of the world. So before the first humans go, we will have a much better knowledge of the value of our proposition. And I believe, and maybe we can ask uh, Rob that, um, this is just one of the risks. I mean, there's many other risks that, uh, that might kill you on Mars. And uh, a lack of financing is one of them, and it's a risk that you can, that you, by the time that they leave in 2024, it's one that you can assess, that you can evaluate, and you, that you can decide for yourself. Rob can decide uh, uh, what are all the risks, including the financial risk, and do I think that I want to take the risk? And at that moment, and that's why I believe the ethical question is not even a question, uh, he has to decide, do I go or do I not go? And who am I to say, or who are you, or you, or anyone else in the room to say, you can't go to Mars because there's risks? Okay, okay well, <laughs> um, to com yeah, and the comment on the ethical risks and uh, the, the resources, when I got the email saying I was a finalist, I, it, it actually, uh, that, that was actually the first time I had to stop and think about what we were doing. Um, and uh, basically, there is something liberating to me about it being a one-way trip and knowing that this is how I'm going to finish my life, is exploring another planet. Now, uh, that, you know, that I'm going to say goodbye to my loved ones, goodbye to my family, and uh, do something that will potentially benefit them in the future. That means a lot to me. And uh, that, you know, taking that on and making it a one-way mission eliminates a lot of the safety issues we deal with right now in spaceflight through low Earth orbit. Um, so that's, a, that's not just a cost-cutting measure, but that also uh, changes things technically. Now, as far as the resources go, I'm going to want to get some fresh fruit and vegetables as soon as possible uh, while we're there, and I think that's got to be a high priority, just to be able to taste and uh, you know um, smell the fresh foods, and uh, that does need to be a priority, and I think that is already part of the, the uh, comprehensive plan. All right. By the way, I just wanted to point out one thing, especially to anticipate tomorrow night's debate. The one thing that Mars One does not need is a faster way to get to Mars. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, it doesn't matter, if you're going to Mars one way to colonize, it doesn't matter whether you get there in six months or five months or four months. The matters that you get there. And uh, I digress. Questions? <laughs> Over there. It would seem if, it's, if the base is set up successfully, there would be the opportunity to get government contract funding for performing tasks that otherwise would be performed by very expensive billion dollar missions to Mars. The geologist could just get on his rover and do the science that the Mars rover would otherwise do. It, would it be a good idea in the panel's view for the Mars 1 mission to accept those kinds of government funding, government contract, it would be better to stay entirely privately funded. I think accepting random government uh, funding for work done is, is not 
being government funded, it's just making money on contracts for the government. That's a different thing than being government funded. But that's so absolutely yeah. somewhere in one of the later pages of the business plan. Um, as an add-on to that though, when you accept government funding, you accept their right to make the rules of how it's being used. And, uh, you know, my company is in partnership with NASA and we have a, we have a lot of rules that we need to follow. And uh, that needs to be taken into account before those funds are accepted. Uh, there, one of the things that we did, and, and I've talked to Boss about this, was uh, develop a drill uh, to drill a water well on Mars, a 20 meter deep well. Uh, actually, it had the potential of going to a kilometer and a half. And um, we looked around for companies that could do that, and this area right here has quite a few drilling companies in it. And we put out a request for information, and the only, well, we got two responses. So one was semi-serious. The other one was from a, a company called Baker Hughes. You know, it's founded by Howard Hughes. And um, they said, we'll help you out, but you got to know up front that it's our corporate pro policy that we do not take government contracts. And so we said, well, how are we going to get money to you? And they said, we are going to do this on overhead. And uh, they developed a splendid, uh, literally beautifully designed and constructed Mars drill bit, which they said would, would drill theoretically to a kilometer in depth, regardless of the kind of uh, medium you were drilling through. Uh, so. Um, there are people out there who will do it, and we said, well, why are you doing this? And they said, just can you imagine in our letterhead saying that we were the first ones to drill a water well anywhere but on the earth. <laughs> John? Uh, the thing I'm interested in is the question of sequence. Uh, for example, let's assume you guys are successful and raise your money and can get prepared to go to Mars. And let's also assume the, the two alternatives are that the go government has funded something like Mars Direct or that the government hasn't funded something like Mars Direct, which is essentially an exploration mission. Now the purpose, one of the critical purposes of such exploration missions is to characterize and to validate specific landing sites which are, of course, scientifically interesting, but also to validate them as a settlement site. And I would expect, before I would want to site a settlement, that I would want to have at least five or ten different sites examined, first from orbit, to really characterize them as best as possible, like, as you said, water sources. You don't want to end up with a Jamestown problem that is a lousy water supply. You want to have a good water supply, whether it's ice, or a brine well or whatever. So that to me, and also of course mineral, the surface minerals that you can access. So th th the question then is, uh, how do you make the decision if if no exploration bases have previously been, been done, do you just put your site anywhere and just hope mm -hmm. for the best or what? But well, indeed the most important resource uh, is water. Yes. And uh, together with uh, Lockheed Martin, we are looking at a number of different potential landing sites. Uh, there's a lot of research being done right now, uh, a lot of papers uh, about to be published on uh, how much water is in the Martian soil, at which location and at which depth. Uh, we're using that data to, uh, to assess our landing site for our first unmanned mission in 2018 which will have a water extraction uh, device, or soil gathering and water evaporation device. Um, and our rover, so our second mission in 2020, will uh, also de determine the, the actual landing site. So our rover will land in the location where we expect the outpost to be. And it will drive around and find a really good location, uh, pinpoint a really good location. So that means flat for construction, 
and it will uh, determine at that exact location the water content of the soil to make sure that we do indeed have access to water. So it's, uh, landing site selection is extremely important and very, very high on our priorities and we will use our precursor missions to determine uh, what we need to know about the location. Would you be able to go as far north as 25 degrees or, or south as far as 25 degrees? Because if they think that there, are, that there are actual ice deposits near surface you know, with significant relatively pure ice on northward facing hillsides in certain spots as close to the equator as 25 degrees. Well, we will try to be as close to the equator as possible because our mission is running on solar panels. But right now we are more conservatively uh, assuming that we will be between uh, 40 and 45 degrees north latitude. Okay. Cliff. At some point, any one-way mission that doesn't have strategy does become a two-way mission. And the question is, how long do you think that has to be? About 20 years, 30 years before people on the surface have the ability to build their own return vehicle and come back if they want to? We have uh, major advances now in 3D printing that might allow them to do a lot of that. I don't know if it would close it all the way. But really, how long do they have to sit there without having their own way to come home? Okay. Well, certainly the first ones won't be coming back because they will be there too long by then. Um, I, uh, I think it's very difficult to, uh, to give an estimate. What I hope is that uh, very soon, like four years after their first landing, I would hope that they can construct a small return vehicle and send the sample back, because that's also in our business plan. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I Okay, well, I, I liked it. I did get asked this question quite a bit, and my joke, my running joke is, well, once gold is discovered on Mars, somebody will start making a uh, return a vehicle. So, once once they uh, find out a way to, once a market's opened up or something, it'll happen. Uh, I don't think that the colonists will be the ones who build the first return vehicle. Uh, the, the technological base, the industrial base, the division of labor, et cetera, available on Earth is, is, is so much better than they'll be on Mars even for a century after the first colonists land, that that is where the spaceships will be built. But if you have the kind of financial engine that I'm talking about in place that supports this colony, then in addition to just continually firing out more one-way uh, shots of supplies and so forth, it will at, at some point develop uh, round-trip uh, uh, hardware. Uh, the, but that, that's where it will be developed. I mean, the idea of, of, of people in, in uh, a Mars colony uh, being the ones who, you know, in other words, to produce a spacecraft you require, for instance, uh, uh, alloys, uh, aluminum alloys, say, of uh, uh, very fine specifications, and uh, or some piece of stainless steel, or maybe composites. All these things that, that are produced by uh, a very large industrial base with, with all sorts of, of, of quality control, and I mean, you, you know the story, I don't know if you've ever read the, the somebody once wrote this essay on the, the you know, the story of a pencil and what, what goes into making a pencil. And it's actually a very good essay. Uh, and the, the, this came from, you know, the wood came from, you know, Oregon, but the, the rubber came from Indonesia. And the, the brass ring around the, uh, that holds the eraser in, uh, you know, came from, you know, wherever. And, 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 uh, and, and, and there are alloys in that brass ring that came from the Congo. And, and, and then the, the carbon in the middle, whatever. And, and, and then the ship that transported the rubber was running on Arab oil. And you know, steel was made in Minnesota, but except for certain alloys, which once again came from Africa. And the crew drank coffee that came from Colombia. And, and there was a the billion people were involved, literally were involved in building the pencil. And um, it, it's true. And there's almost nothing you use that hasn't 
a very large number of people involved in making it. And so, uh, the, and, and even farmers who grow a crop, at least in this country, um, most of their food, you know, they may grow a lot of corn, but then the variety of other things they eat came from all over the place. Uh, they, they don't really grow most of the food that they eat. And uh, so, and then the, the higher up you go technologically, the, the more necessary this division of labor becomes. And in other words, uh, the crew on Mars could, as, uh, I believe that the parts will come from Earth, but it would help tremendously to have a crew on Mars that can assemble it, that can test it, that can fuel it, that can make sure it's good, and then it departs. And that's my big problem with the return mission. It's how can you expect to have a return rocket on Mars waiting to be launched if we can't even get a, a, 100% success rate on, on Earth. I mean, recently a proton rocket exploded. It's one of the most built rockets, uh, and recently one exploded. A thousand people must be working on that. And that's my big concern with the return mission. If we can't do it from Earth, how can we expect to successfully launch a rocket carrying humans off the surface of Mars? We did it from the moon. I mean, I, I think it's certainly technically possible. But it's, it's, it's different, of course, from the moon than from Mars because it's a much smaller system. Uh, you, you can land bigger things on the moon without any problems because there's no uh, atmosphere at all. Uh, you, you need to fly the return mission for only three days. Uh, you, so there, it's a lot, yeah, a lot easier from the moon than from but, Mars. But people who designed that successful lunar return vehicle didn't even have push button let alone these, okay? I mean, it, relative to the technology at the time, that was far more challenging, and, and it was done. But also the risks that they were willing to accept were a lot higher. Um, let's see, let's take one from over here. Uh, you, sir. Yeah, you, that's right. Um, I'm sorry, you're being correct on the topic of this event. Uh, considering that the curiosity Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I didn't want to say it. <laughs> Let's have the NASA guy say it. Okay, okay, what you just said. Well, I think you all heard me. It's because NASA did it. Uh, it's, uh, you know, we've, we've done, seriously though, we've done a lot, of, a lot of studies, and I'll be brief on this, about why NASA's stuff costs more than anybody else's. In fact, that was uh, one of my things that I did in my last few years in NASA was study the, the behavioral aspects of, of cultures. And the NASA culture is so wired in to doing things in a very, very expensive way. JPL, by the way, is the most expensive of all the NASA centers on a pound per pound or whatever uh, basis that you want to measure. And so uh, that's why the opportunities for people like us and people uh, like uh, SpaceX uh, have arisen is because NASA has done things in an excellent way, uh, but they've done them in a very, very expensive way. Okay, this, uh, oh, did somebody else have to go? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Very practically, even if uh, NASA was a lean mean uh, machine, then they would still have the issue, for example, of uh, geographical spread. I think NASA has that too, right? That you, you have, NASA has to allocate certain parts of a rover to certain different states, which means that you have to write huge uh, interface documents, whereas Mars One doesn't have that political problem. We just find the best supplier and we have them build the entire machine. And if they need a sub-supplier, sub sub then it's their problem. And we let them take care of it. And we're, we don't want to be in between. We pay them the, a success fee. They get their their final fee only if they uh, lend a, if they have a successful uh, component. So we put all the problems in their lap. Yeah. 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 Ye
which is actually what they like, because then they can take as exactly as much uh, measurements to make it work as necessary, and not more. Okay, let's have one last question. Uh, okay, we have one with the uh, patent right here. What are the, once one vehicle lands, what are the chances that some other company might say, we can do this too? In essence, there would be some other company. Um, uh, then the Mars colony would have company. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that, that concludes the, the, the night session. Uh, no, but I really mean it. It'd be good for there to be more colonies because then there'd be more people. The, the, the thing that's going to be in shorter supply on Mars will be human skill and human labor. The sooner you can get more people there with a larger variety of skills and a larger division of labor, the better off everyone's going to be. All right, so we reconvene at 9 o'clock tomorrow. Thank you.